the President of the United States, the most powerful human being in the world. No one could have foreseen the seismic shocks America would suffer in the 20th century. The assassination of its youngest ever leader, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and the disgrace of its most successful election winner, Richard Milhouse Nixon. One man destined to die, the other never to be forgiven. This is a dramatic reconstruction of events as they happened on two days that shook the world. The 8th of August, 1974. At the Geneva Peace Conference, negotiations continue on the future of Cyprus. In Belfast, Northern Ireland, vehicles are set alight in protest at the British government's internment policy. In Buenos Aires, Eva Perón is sworn in as interim leader of Argentina. And in Washington, D.C., President Richard Nixon is to be impeached following his role in the Watergate break-in. 10.45 a.m., the White House, Washington. 51-year-old Ollie Atkins loads his cameras with two rolls of black and white film. Ollie has been ordered to get over to the Oval Office as quickly as possible. A meeting will take place at 11 o'clock between the Vice President and the President. Richard Milhouse Nixon, 37th President of the United States. Ollie is the White House Chief Photographer. Today will be the biggest day of his career. This morning, the White House is under siege. Political aides and party workers face a major crisis. The press are camped out everywhere. Yesterday, it was announced that President Nixon is to be impeached. He will be tried by the US Senate for high crimes and misdemeanors. The charges stem from his involvement in a political scandal known as Watergate. At stake, the presidency itself, his political career, and even his freedom. Meanwhile, on the other side of the White House in the Nixon family residence, Manolo Sanchez is emptying drawers. He has been valet to Richard Nixon for 13 years. His wife, Fina, is the personal maid to First Lady Pat Nixon. Vice President Gerald Ford arrives, and Ollie waits with him outside the Oval Office. He follows him in a minute later, and the President turns to him. How do you want us, Ollie? He asks. Uh, please, Mr. Ford. The President is smiling. Ollie asks him to be more serious. Nixon and Ford discuss how to respond to the current impeachment crisis. The president's career has been something of a roller coaster ride, but right now his prospects look bleak. It seems Nixon's luck has run out. He has been a president with the knack of being in the right place at the right time. In his first term, he welcomed home America's first men on the moon, though it had been Presidents Kennedy and Johnson who had put them there. But Nixon was also the architect of significant milestones in Cold War diplomacy. In 1972, he was the first American president to ever visit China and Moscow. At the very moment Nixon was enjoying his greatest political achievement, the seeds of his eventual downfall were being sown. Reports were emerging of a seemingly insignificant break-in at the Watergate building in Washington. On June 17, 1972, Five men were caught installing bugging devices in the offices of the Democratic Party in the Watergate complex. Two of the men had CIA connections. Another was James McCord, Nixon's Republican security chief. Justice will be pursued fairly, fully, and impartially, no matter who is involved. 11.45 a.m and Vice President Ford leaves the Oval Office. He has a momentous day ahead of him. If Nixon is forced out of power, then Ford will assume the presidency. But Richard Nixon has proved his ability to fight his way back when the political odds seem stacked against him. 22 years ago, he fought a charge of embezzlement while standing for election. I don't believe that I ought to quit because I'm not a quitter. Encouraged by intense coverage by the Washington Post, the FBI began to investigate following the Watergate burglary in 1972. 
but Nixon himself seemed untouched by it. He was re-elected the same year with the biggest landslide in US history. Just days after Nixon celebrated his re-election, the five Watergate burglars and two accomplices went to trial and to prison in January 1973. Nixon was still at a safe distance, the hero of the hour for negotiating a ceasefire in Vietnam. 12.15 p.m. Ollie Atkins races ahead of the president to the executive office building. Nixon walks across five minutes later. He's due to meet with his personal lawyer to discuss his options. The crowds are building up outside the White House following yesterday's impeachment announcement. The media are campaigning for and anticipating Nixon's resignation. The political climate remains tense. Last October, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned over charges of tax evasion. His was not the only resignation of 1973. The domestic affairs assistant, John Ehrlichman, resigned pending trial for obstruction of justice. And most damaging of all, the Attorney General John Mitchell, apparently the ringleader of the Watergate bugging team, was forced to quit. We have faced other crises in our history and we have become stronger by rejecting the easy way out and taking the right way in meeting our challenges. Our greatness as a nation has been our capacity to do what has to be done. And we knew our course was right. For two years, Nixon has claimed there had been no attempt to prevent the FBI's investigation of the Watergate break-in. We must maintain the integrity of the White House. And that integrity must be real, not transparent. There can be no whitewash at the White House. But a taped conversation has revealed that there was a whitewash. Only a week after the break-in, Nixon and Chief of Staff Bob Holderman colluded to block the FBI investigation of Watergate. This taped conversation is the smoking gun that finally proves Nixon's direct involvement in the Watergate cover-up. Richard Nixon is now considering his position. The president leaves the executive building, already facing impeachment and the threat of legal action. Richard Nixon has decided to resign. He will be the first American president to resign from office. The president walks through the corridors of the White House. The West Wing was strangely quiet. Desks that had never been uncluttered were cleared. Only the steady ringing of the phones gave the place a sense of purpose, of life. Everything else seemed frozen. Manolo Sanchez is preparing the president's lunch. He takes a special pride in it today. Cottage cheese and pineapple and a glass of milk. He insists on taking it across to the president personally. The president is taking a nap. He skips Manolo's lunch. Ollie takes a snap of it, feeling that every moment, every detail is now historic. Richard Nixon's last White House meal. Nixon spends the afternoon locked away, writing his speech, the resignation speech. He will broadcast live to the nation at nine this evening. Raymond K. Price Jr. is also working on the president's speech. He's been on the staff for seven years and wrote Nixon's inaugural speech in 1969. Tonight's address will be typed in large print letters so the president can read it on television without glasses. Half an hour later, an hour until airtime, Nixon meets 46 friends and supporters in the cabinet room. Nixon mentions that he will fly home to California tomorrow and will have the black briefcase with the presidential nuclear launch codes with him until Air Force One lands in California. The president is unaware 
that Defence Secretary James R. Schlesinger, a so-called supporter, will have removed the briefcase from the aircraft. He has also instructed the Joint Chiefs of Staff that any order for military movement from the White House must be countersigned by him. The Schlesinger Protectorate is intended to impede any last-minute military coup by President Nixon. Ollie Atkins is preparing to photograph the President's speech. Two roles, color and black and white. He is standing in the corridor as Nixon leaves the cabinet room, saying to his friends, I just hope I haven't let you down. Outside the White House gates, the public are anticipating the President's address. Inside the White House, the staff gather around television sets as they await the President's speech. The President is taken to a room adjacent to the Oval Office for makeup prior to the broadcast at nine. He remembers refusing makeup for the presidential candidate's debate with Kennedy back in 60. He looked terrible. Some still say this is why he lost that year. We know what peace demands. We will keep America the strongest nation in the world. And we will couple that strength with firm diplomacy. The president knows he has destroyed himself. He installed the secret White House taping system that revealed his complicity in the Watergate cover-up. He had recorded himself, planning it with his chief of staff a week after the 1972 break-in. The president was forced to release the tape of this conversation only two weeks ago. It's evidence that he has lied, and it could yet send him to prison. Those acts cannot be defended. Those who were guilty of abuses must be punished. Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman resigned last autumn over Watergate and now stands to go to jail for obstruction of justice and perjury. Nixon could face the same fate at the hands of special prosecutor Leon Jaworski. Some of the best writing has been done in jail, Nixon quips to his lawyer, masking a real fear of prison. To most of us, Watergate has come to mean not just a burglary and bugging of party headquarters, but a whole series of acts that either represent or appear to represent an abuse of trust. Nixon is overwrought, and the makeup girl is asked to leave while he regains his composure. Eight fifty-eight p.m. The president sits down behind the desk in the Oval Office. Ollie usually takes snaps before or after a speech, but wants it real and live this time. The president reluctantly agrees. As the shutter clicks repeatedly, Nixon is very nervous and makes jokes and comments which no one reacts to. Without realizing it, he is wearing the same suit and tie he was wearing when the Watergate burglary took place in June 1972. Manolo is in the kitchen with the staff watching television. All over the White House, staff gather around television sets to witness the president's historic address. At exactly 9.01 p.m., President Nixon addresses the nation for the last time. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. 110 million people across America are watching. 40 million are listening to the radio. Throughout the speech, I looked down at the pages of the text, but I did not really read it. That speech was truly in my heart. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. Ollie shifts onto the porch and photographs the president through the window in the middle of the speech. Nixon does not acknowledge any guilt over Watergate, but says he will be too distracted by the scandal to be an effective leader. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford. 9.16 p.m. Nixon finishes the speech without breaking down. He is sweating profusely so much so that his suit is ringing wet. He jokes with the TV crew, who stand respectfully silent around him. 
the president hands out old election souvenirs to the camera operators. Well, that's what's left, boys, he says. The president makes his way over to the family residence to be with his family. There were pictures yesterday evening of a similar emotional gathering. Tonight, Ollie has not been invited. Outside, the crowd chants, jail to the chief. The family departs, and Manolo brings the president bacon and eggs in the Lincoln sitting room. He leaves the room, but hovers near in case the president needs him. Nixon starts making phone calls. Meanwhile, two of the Watergate prosecution team are preparing a formal recommendation for Nixon's arrest following his departure tomorrow. In any organization, the man at the top must bear the responsibility. That responsibility, therefore, belongs here, in this office. I accept it. Nixon awakes thinking it's 4.30. Two hours early, he gets up anyway to fix himself a snack. He's surprised to find Manolo already up. And the two men quickly discover that the president's watch must have stopped during the night. Time is still ticking for Richard Nixon. Nixon is working on the morning address to the White House staff. Chief of Staff General Al Haig enters the Lincoln Room with the President's resignation letter. Surrounded with the memoirs of past Presidents, Nixon signs his name. He has been President for just over 2,000 days. While Nixon completes his final duties, his fate is about to be determined. Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski receives the memo detailing the reasons to prosecute the president. To preserve the integrity of the criminal justice system, a person should not be permitted to trade in the abused office in return for immunity. Mr. Nixon's aides are to be prosecuted for the same offenses. Leon Jaworski agrees to consider prosecuting Nixon. Manolo fights back the tears as the first family arrive in the lift by the East Room where the President will speak. When the Marine Band strikes up with Oklahoma in the Grand Hall, Pat Nixon is upset to learn that TV cameras are present. Her husband says he authorized it. Manolo remains at the back of the room. Ollie Atkins and his team photograph the President's farewell remarks to the White House staff. The emotion in the room was overpowering. For several minutes, I could not quiet the applause. After I started to talk, I began to look around. I think the record should show that uh, this is one of those uh, spontaneous uh, things that we always arrange whenever the President comes in to speak. By now, I was fighting back a flood tide of emotions. And, uh, it will be so Last night had been the formal speech mind. for history. But now I had the chance to speak personally and intimately to these people who had worked so hard for me and whom I had let down so badly. And this is there is no to... mention of Watergate. For the first time, Nixon wears his glasses in front of the public. He quotes his hero, Theodore Roosevelt, directly from the page. She was beautiful in face. Nixon uses the example of Roosevelt's resilience after losing his wife as an encouragement to his own followers. This was in his diary. He said, And when my heart's dearest died, <clears throat> died, the light went from my life forever. Always remember, Others may hate you, 
But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. I want to say for each and every one of you, not only will we always remember you, not only will we always be grateful to you, but always you will be in our hearts and you will be in our prayers. Thank you very much. Everybody else was fighting back tears and trying to keep from breaking down. But at the end of it, when he made a thumbs up signal, he looked remarkably like he did when he was on the campaign trail. Ollie hurries to where the helicopter is waiting in front of the crowds. When he takes off with the president, his staff will take pictures on the ground. Richard and Pat Nixon are escorted to the presidential helicopter Marine One by Gerald and Betty Ford. The memory of that scene for me is like a frame of film forever frozen at that moment. The red carpet, the green lawn, the White House, the leaden sky, the starched uniforms and polished shoes of the honor guard. Nixon gives his characteristic victory salute to the press and staff, and the helicopter takes them to Andrews Air Force Base, where the President boards Air Force One for the last time. The one-line resignation letter is presented to Henry Kissinger, who formally countersigns it. Noon. Nixon is in Air Force One sipping a martini. His resignation is now effective. He is no longer president. Back in Washington, his chair is removed from the Oval Office as all traces of Richard Nixon are erased. The office is prepared for the new president. Exactly three minutes later, Gerald Ford takes the oath in the White House and becomes the 38th president of the United States. Simultaneously, Air Force One loses its presidential name and officially becomes simply Spirit of 76. Richard Nixon's plane heads for California and exile. Awaiting him is a room full of flowers sent by well-wishers. Ollie Atkins takes a picture, his last as official photographer to Richard Nixon. Almost immediately, Gerald Ford replaced Ollie Atkins with his own photographer. Ollie left the White House a few weeks later to become vice president of a publishing company. Manolo Sanchez remained with the Nixons until they left California in 1980 soon after he returned to Spain. In February 1975, Bob Haldeman went to prison. In total, almost 30 people were imprisoned in connection with Watergate. Richard Nixon remained in California with his family. Jaworski did not act on the prosecution memo, but many still demanded that Nixon should be jailed. In September 1974, President Ford used his position to publicly pardon the former president for all offenses against the United States. In accepting his pardon, Nixon finally accepted his guilt. To have served in this office is to have felt a very personal sense of kinship with each and every American. In leaving it, I do so with this prayer. May God's grace be with you in all the days ahead.